I've mentioned before, I think, that I used to live in DeKalb, Illinois. It's a corn town, about 50,000 people, and about an hour west of Chicago. For those of you who have never lived in Illinois, that's far enough away from Chicago to not really be in Chicago, but close enough that when people ask people from DeKalb where they're from, they just say Chicago. Anyway, about a year ago, I was stringing for a local paper in DeKalb, Illinois. Being a stringer means that you don't work full-time for the newspaper. You're just on call for whenever they have a story. For a while, I was writing a story about once every week during the summer. Maybe two if I was lucky. I got paid 30 bucks for a piece, or 50 if I got pictures. This was the third news operation I had been a part of, after doing radio news back in Elk City, Oklahoma, and being co-editor of my college paper back in Weatherford. I wasn't very familiar with DeKalb, Illinois at the time. So I asked the owner what type of people read our paper. He told me they were older. They were middle class. They were white. They wanted to read about scandals and the economy. They were who I was supposed to write for. So that was kind of gross. I don't know how common these ideas are in the industry. I do know that newspaper readers have declined over the years in the face of radio and television and that newspapers now are struggling to figure out how to do the whole online thing. I know that national news has been under intense scrutiny since the idea of fake news became so prominent. I also know what the inside of Ida B. Wells' house looks like. Have y'all ever heard of Ida B. Wells? She was born as an enslaved person in the mid-1800s, and she became an investigative journalist. She co-owned her own newspaper, the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight. The house in Mississippi had been built by her parents for their enslavers. She went back and bought that house. It was an incredible thing to walk around inside of it. It was victorious in there, like a conquered battleground. One time, Wells bought a first-class ticket on a train, only to be told that she had to sit in the back in the Jim Crow section, which, of course, had no first-class seats. When the conductor tried to move her by force, she bit him on the back of the hand and then sued the railroad. We do stand a queen, don't we? <laughs> In her newspaper, she did the first major work on the reality of lynching in the South. In response, a white mob burned her newspaper. She ended up moving to Chicago and eventually to England to continue her work. And in 1909, she helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. This year, she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize Special Citation for her outstanding and courageous reporting. She once said, quote, The way to right wrongs is to shine the light of truth on them. So when I think about what we're doing, when we engage in journalism, that's what I think about. I don't think about the white middle-class folks who want their sex scandals and Dow Jones reports. I think about justice. I think about truth. And I think about the legacy of journalists who have come before with the purpose of righting wrongs. This is Intro to Mass Media. I'm Daniel Thompson, and this week's about newspapers. The history of newspapers is long and complicated. The textbook does a good job going over it, so I don't think I will here. Instead, I want to focus in on one specific tension that has existed for as long as the newspapers have. That's the dynamic between what is true and a focus on what sells the newspapers. See, folks don't just want to be informed. They want to be entertained. If people just wanted to know things, they wouldn't watch courtroom dramas. They'd read court cases. If people wanted to learn history, they wouldn't watch Mel Gibson scalping British people. They'd read the Federalist Papers or the Constitution. Likewise, when people read the news, they don't just want to be informed. They want to be entertained. And that's a problem because the truth is often not entertaining. Oftentimes, it's complicated and boring and nuanced and not the sort of thing that makes what people consider an entertaining solid, grab-you-by-the-throat headline. Papers throughout history have strived to meet the challenge of people wanting entertainment in a variety of ways. Two rich white guys, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, each owned a newspaper and competed with each other for readers with headlines that emphasized sex, violence, and crime. 
Thigh of the body found was a headline that appeared in Hearst's New York Journal, for instance. The two went at it so hard, stretching the truth to be that much more outrageous, that they basically started the Spanish-American War by exaggerating the events leading up to it and blaming the Spanish in Cuba for what evidence was not accounted for. There was a ship that sunk off the coast of Cuba, and they blamed the Spanish, and they stirred up in people a desire to go to war. This practice came to be known as yellow journalism. It was the fake news of the day. And, of course, people ate it up, and it cost lives. This work continued on into the founding of tabloid journalism, the type that you might see at the checkout line at a grocery store. My favorite as a kid um, was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer found in Sarah Palin's freezer. I was also a fan of images of the alligator person that I often saw in, on the cover. Um, also, Hillary Clinton is running for president and Bigfoot is her running mate. I remember seeing that one on a tabloid headline. A focus on scandal and depth pervaded these <laughs> publications and brought with them further ethical issues. On a more serious note, one journalist snuck a camera into an execution and photographed a woman being electrocuted to death. That photo was printed on the front page. Do journalists have the right to do that? What business is it of the general public to see the last moments of a human being? This practice hasn't ended. My brother-in-law talks about all the things he's seen online. Pictures of people about to be hit by trains, falling off skyscrapers. I've seen pictures of children starving and vultures waiting. Of an assassin having just killed a political figure just last year in the second after he did it. That picture, by the way, it won a Pulitzer Prize. I wonder if that isn't kind of fitting, given what Joseph Pulitzer was willing to do to get people to look and read and buy. This is the sort of question that journalists ask themselves. Is it worth it to show people this thing? Is showing something horrible worth it so that people know something horrible has taken place? Does the public have a right to know? Journalism is so much more complicated than just showing up and writing about something that happens. There's a question in it, a matter of privacy, a matter of what do we want to know, why, and do we deserve to know it? There is another way newspapers have been able to draw eyes, and that's by being what's called alternate presses. Emancipation and women's suffrage gave birth to papers that would become voices of social protest. Freedom's Journal, launched in response to the mainstream racist papers of its time, lasted for two years in the early 1800s and printed 2,700 newspapers. The North Star, founded by Frederick Douglass, found a lot more long-term success. Women's rights papers also flourished, and the same pattern has repeated itself over the years with publications like war protest papers back in the 1960s, protesting the war in Vietnam. The other day, while stopping into a half-price books in Elk City, I picked up a copy of The Gailey, an LGBTQ-centered publication. The key to these papers' success was getting a large enough audience to support them. While most papers sought a broad audience, these alternate presses sought smaller ones, but counted on the content to make them essential to the populations they hoped to serve. This is in contrast to most newspapers. Most newspapers hope to get a broad smattering of different people to read them. Especially papers like the New York Times, they hope to get a national audience of lots of people hoping to read their papers, but these sought out specific audiences. That was their strength. These forms of journalism should all sound familiar to you. I at least see them every single day played out on my social media pages. Picture yours right now. Whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever you use, I want you to imagine each person posting as their own newspaper, as if every single social media user were Joseph Pulitzer or William Randolph Hearst. What are their headlines? I can see my buddy Isaiah, he keeps me up to date on mental health and LGBTQ culture. He posts mostly text-based memes, ones that are copied from Twitter or Tumblr. I have my friend Jake. He posts Atlantic or NPR articles about current political events 
and he makes his own reasoned commentary. I see Brandon, who posts images of soldiers with text that demands respect for them, or pictures of the Thunder basketball team kneeling with text that tells them he won't be watching anymore. I see Aaron, posting a maskless and proud of it selfie, telling me that women's rights begin in the womb. And then there are posts about the Hollywood sex ring, about Bill Gates and his microchips that will be in some future COVID-19 vaccine, and about the curing power of the essential oils my mom used to rub on me. You know, maybe those things have some healing power. Maybe it's kind of like Vicks VapoRub. Maybe it's the fumes. I see people bleeding, bloody, injured, or dead. I've seen more dead people on social media than I ever expected that I would. Activism, scandal, sex, violence. It's all the same stuff vying for our attention. This time, it's just making Mark Zuckerberg money instead of Joseph Pulitzer. Each social media user has become their very own news site, and without any training whatsoever. We've made journalists out of ourselves, but we never went to school for it. We don't know the skills, and we don't carry the same sense of responsibility. Newspapers unionized in the 1930s. This development brought with it an ethical code of conduct that has been maintained and improved over the years. I'm going to post the most popular such code on D2L, but here are some of the headlines. Journalists should take responsibility for the accuracy of their work. Verify information before releasing it. Use original sources whenever possible. Provide context. Take special care not to misrepresent or oversimplify in promoting, pre previewing, or summarizing a story. Be vigilant and courageous about holding those with power accountable. Give voice to the voiceless. Support the open and civil exchange of views, even views you find repugnant. Recognize a special obligation to serve as watchdogs over public affairs and the government. Never plagiarize. Always attribute information. Recognize that legal access to information differs from an ethical justification to publish or broadcast it. This is more than a code of ethics. It's a code of honor. It does serve to protect newspapers legally, but also, also serves to prove why newspapers are still needed. People posting to social media don't take any of these things into account. The number of memes that I've fact-checked and found to be flat wrong over the past few months has been incredible. The amount of harm that people have been willing to cause to advance whatever they believe has been ridiculous. I've also seen the powers of this world held to account, one person at a time. Social media is a stunning, game-changing thing for news, but reporting is more than meme sharing. It's hard work. It's dirty, mind-numbing work. It's exhilarating, dangerous work. It's work that has to be done, and it's work that's increasingly being threatened. Right now, newspapers are shrinking. Newsrooms that used to employ 100 people now employ 30. Small town newspapers that only had 10 or so people to begin with are closing and are being bought up by massive newspaper corporations in order to save costs. One of these is the Gillette. This is the news corporation that owns a paper even as big as the Oklahoman. Uh, earlier last week, we had a lady come in and talk to us from the Oklahoman. They have internship opportunities, by the way, that often lead to jobs, for those of you who are interested. More people are reading national news, like the New York Times, instead of their local newspapers, like my hometown's Elk City Daily, or where I currently live's the Yukon Progress. The reason has been twofold. One, radio and TV have put a lot of pressure on newspapers. They give people options for how to get their news. I'm not much of a TV news guy myself. I prefer reading. But a lot of people still turn to their cable or satellite stations for their national and local news. Plus, social media has put the hurt on many papers, with only the largest jumping quickly onto the online bandwagon. Going online has its own problems. Ad revenue isn't nearly as good online as it is in physical papers. So not only are newspapers losing readers, they're also losing advertisers. That loss of revenue has caused newspapers all across the nation to tighten their belts 
or close down. Those that remain are stretched thin. See, newspapers make money in two ways, off ad revenue and from subscriptions, and ad revenue brings in a lot more. Both are problematic when you go online. If you click on a website and it tells you that you have to pay to see what's inside, I don't know about you, but I'll just click away and look for someplace else that's free. And because very few people click on internet ads, they're not worth as much as a newspaper ad that you might actually take the time to read. Newspapers are set up with two sides, the editorial side and the business side. The editorial side writes everything that goes in the paper. You have editors of different parts of the paper, like the business section or the entertainment section, and then you have reporters who work underneath them full time, and then maybe some part-time stringers like I was back in Illinois. The business side has ad salespeople, and they keep the lights on. Newspapers also buy stories from major syndicates, like the Associated Press, to cover news that they themselves weren't able to cover. So like a small town paper, they can't pay to have a reporter in DC all the time. So being able to run stories from the AP out of DC can help keep a lot of local readers informed, but that costs too. Despite the challenges being faced, there are actually a lot of jobs for students who want to work in newspapers. Like I mentioned, the Oklahoman still recruits paid interns, many of whom become employees. They've retired their older, more experienced, higher paid employees and are opening jobs for hungry, younger journalists to fill their positions. Students who get involved in their campus paper, especially those who put in the time to become an editor, tend to get hired, especially if that paper is good. By the way, our local paper, the Gazette, here on campus, it's good. We win awards at competition against much bigger schools. But we are still a print-only newspaper. As someone who's only been here at Langston for three weeks now, <laughs> that's something I'm hoping to change. For those of you who have little to no interest in being newspaper people, there's still a lot of reward that comes out of working at one in a college. Not in a touchy-feely sort of way, though students who work together often become lifelong friends. I even know a few that have gotten married. But in a real, tangible way, out in the job market later on, nearly every job calls for the type of person who's curious, who's willing to ask questions, and who can write their butts off. So here's how to do the work. First, you need curiosity. You gotta have a need to know, a want to, to find stuff out. My dad always told me that I had an astounding lack of curiosity, but I disagree. I've learned a lot more about lighthouses than he has, for instance, and a lot more about the Senate career of Lyndon B. Johnson. And not because I watch YouTube videos either. I read books, thick old books, but it takes more than curiosity. It takes courage. It's hard to walk up to somebody with a notepad and ask them questions. It's also adrenaline pumping and intoxicating. It's a powerful feeling to send an email to the university president asking about the KKK carved into the sidewalk in front of the education building. It's crazy to walk up to a mother whose daughter saved an old woman from a burning apartment building to ask how she's holding up without a home. I've had to do both of those things. You want to choose your words carefully or to turn away and just not ask questions at all, but you gotta ask questions. It's the job. This class may be your first step into the broadcast journalism major. Your next step will be into news writing. It's a rigorous, intense class. It will require you to build writing skills you were never taught in school, have never had the chance to practice. But by the time you finish it, you'll be good. You'll be dang good. And you'll only get better. Writing is one of those things that only gets better by doing more of it. This week, you're going to practice some of the building blocks of writing a news brief. It's the simplest type of story there is. These elements have names, and I'm going to go over some of those now. I'm going to tell you about something called the inverted pyramid. That's the inverted pyramid. It's kind of a funky concept, but here's what I want you to imagine. Imagine one of the great big old pyramids out in Egypt that we learned about in middle school. I want you to picture the massive stones at the very bottom of the pyramid. They're the most important. They hold the whole thing up. Imagine that those are the most important basic details of a news story. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. 
Now take the pyramid and flip it upside down. Now those important details are at the top. That's how it ought to be in news writing. Your first sentence or so is called the lead sentence. And in that one to two sentences, you want to sum up the whole story so that a person could read the first sentence or two and know all the basic details they need to without reading anything else. The beginning of the news story should have all the founding information in it. And as the story goes on, information should be less crucial. It's still important information, but you want to build the story from there, adding more details as you go along. So the middle pyramid uh, should have things like quotes which help people understand what happened in greater detail. And the very tip of the pyramid, which is at the very end of the story, should have details that are still relevant enough to be included, but the least relevant to understanding what happened. It's very different from essay writing. In essays, we have an introduction where we kind of lead into the subject, we build our points along the way, and then, well, pow, we hit them with a conclusion and convince them of an argument or something. News essay writing is so much different. It's you, you flip that structure. You start with the point. You get to it quick, and then you build the extra important relevant details as you go along. So you don't build to it or try to surprise your audience. You don't even lead in slowly and build suspense. In the basic inverted pyramid style, you tell them everything they need to know right at the beginning in the lead and build the rest of it out as you go. Our assignment this week is pretty fun. So I want you to take your favorite movie and write a new story about it, as if you were a reporter living in the world of that movie. So take either an event that happens in the movie or the movie on a whole and write about it in a new style. I have more information for you about that on D2L, along with a bit of an example piece that I wrote for one of my favorite movies, Face Off, starring Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. I don't want to sound like I'm advertising something here. I don't get ad revenue from this podcast or anything. That would be weird. But Face Off, Nicolas Cage, John Travolta, it's the best movie that's ever been created. I cannot recommend it enough. I don't know. It's just, it's so ridiculous. It's about Nicolas Cage is a terrorist and John Travolta is an FBI agent. And, like, John Travolta, like, takes Nicolas Cage's face and wears it, and then Nicolas Cage gets John Travolta's face, and he wears it, and they're, they, I have to pretend to be each other. And, like, so the whole movie is John Travolta acting like Nicolas Cage, acting like John Travolta, and then Nicolas Cage acting as if John Travolta is acting like Nicolas Cage. It's a mess. It's beautiful. I love it. So that is what we're going to be doing this week. We also have a discussion board that you need to take part in, um, and... If you would go ahead and look at the chapter on newspapers, I do recommend it. Don't feel like you have to read the whole chapter, but do feel like you got to look at it. And if you see something interesting, you got to read it. But don't feel like you have to read it cover to cover. It's got great history, but it's a little dry in spots. What's important about this class is the podcast, the discussion boards, and the projects. Now, another thing that we have going on this week, I have decided to continue taking our Zoom meetings in a more practical direction. Uh, we will be doing more things like tutorials, more things closer to traditional lectures. Also this week, we have our majors meeting. We were going to have it last week, but this is going to be a mandatory Zoom meeting on Thursday at 9.30 a.m. It's very important that you attend this meeting. This will be a chance for you to meet all the professors in the broadcast journalism major and it will be a chance for you to meet all the other students who are in your major currently. It's a really good opportunity. It's a way that you can kind of start getting into the department. And since, since we're not meeting a whole lot in person right now, at least not all at once, um, it's, it's a good thing. We will be meeting some of us in person. Um, we can only meet nine at a time. So what I'm going to do is open up lots of office hours for you guys. Some of you have already visited me in my office hours to work on your blogs. That's great. Keep doing that. So the people who can meet during the week, we're going to meet for class. Um, I will send emails out to those of you who will have that opportunity. Everyone else, if you want to meet and go over stuff in person, if you want to learn in person, that's great. Just send me a time either through remind or through email that you would like to come by and we'll make it happen for you. I am excited to continue working with you all. You all are insanely bright. You are insanely capable. I am so happy to be working with all of you this semester. 
You guys are great. I hope you have a fantastic week. I'm sure I will be speaking to a lot of you again. Newspapers, just to summarize, a very cool form of mass media. One that's a little bit endangered at the moment, but one that we desperately need. It's a really, really good thing to be involved in newspapers. And as you go through this major, you're going to get a chance. Don't leave that behind, though, when you move on to radio and TV. There's something for just about every type of person in newspaper writing. And the skills that you learn there don't only affect you in a newspaper context, but they go on and they really pay off in other jobs later on. So that's all I've got for today. I hope you enjoyed listening, and I will see you around.